This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week's episode has been brought to you by Manscaped and Ritual. Support for Walk-In's Welcome comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Ritual is the obsessively researched vitamin for women. Better health doesn't happen overnight. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in the gaps in your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash walk-in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash walk-in. This week, we're excited to have Helen Pluckrose on the show. She is an exile from the humanities with research interests in the late medieval, early modern religious writing by and about women. She is currently writing a book about postmodernism and critical theory and their impact on epistemology and ethics in the academy and more widely. She is editor-in-chief of ARIO. Now, this might not sound like the most engaging of topics. It's very heady, but Helen is by far none one of the most brilliant women I have ever had the honor of speaking to. She is fighting the good fight. She is also one of the co-authors of the Grievance Studies, and nobody really understands critical theory better than Helen. So enjoy. I'm with Helen Pluckrose, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time out of your relaxing day off after all of the activities. Mm -hmm. We're in Aspen together in an undisclosed commune that we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the owner of the house doesn't know we're uh, planning to make it into a commune, but we'll, um, we'll introduce her to this gently. Yeah, <laughs> she, she doesn't know yet we're taking over her house. <laughs> you are one of the three, the now infamous three of the grievance studies. Mm -hmm. And I got to watch all three of you speak last night. I've never met you in person, obviously, because you are from the island, <laughs> as Peter <laughs> refers to it. Whereabouts are you from? You know, are you from London proper? Were you born and raised there? Yeah, I was born and raised in London, in East London. I'm, I've just moved three miles out of the city now because it's okay. a little bit greener. And would you, did you uh, were you always in academia? Is no. that your, okay? So. <laughs> What did you want to be when you were like a 12 year old? Mm. I think I think at 12, I wanted to be a writer. But by the time I'd finished secondary school, I decided I wasn't academic at all. And I was going to be a care assistant instead. Okay. And how long did you do that? 17 years. 17 years? Yeah, I, um, I moved out of my parents when I was 18, managed to get a small flat. And I was uh, a care assistant in um, hospitals, um, sort of care homes, nursing homes, mm -hmm. and um, in peop elderly people's own homes for, for 17 years after that. That is God's work. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. I, I got a reputation for being good with people with challenging behavior. So it's people with um, learning dementia. disability, mm -hmm. dementia, people who are aggressive anyway. So okay. I, um, I actually quite enjoyed working with them, learning how to sort of soothe things and de-escalate things. I suddenly understand why you're so good with social justice warriors. <laughs> <laughs> this makes so much more sense to me now. So I, I've definitely spent time, um, a couple of old timers in recovery, they've died over the years, but I always end up going to see them in the, in the homes or wherever. And they're such a different, I don't know, the, the work that the people who do, it feels like such a job that's so underappreciated by the general public. Mm. And it just seems like it's so hard and sad. And I don't know, how, how do you handle that emotionally? 
It worries me a lot because the problem is that care work is sort of paid in the UK anyway at minimum wage. Yeah, I think it's the same here. And it's considered unskilled work. Yeah. So the people who go into it are often people who can't really get a job anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So they may not at all be motivated by trying to make the life of um, somebody who's vulnerable, who's elderly, who's confused, more enjoyable. Right. They might just sort of be going through the motions. And we did see quite a lot of that. So I, I don't know how we would actually change the system in order to actually train people a bit more and and pay them a bit more. So it gets the, the people who really like the work. Yeah, that was one thing I noticed was both in both cases, the people um, in, and there's such a drastic level in the United States in care, depending on what your retirement looks like, the state funded versus um, the if you have a little bit more money to pay. And in the state funded ones or I don't know, Medicare or whatever it is who pays for that. And they all their jewelry and stuff will go missing. Like the guy, he had this ring that he loved and he's like, I know they took it. I know the guy and no one believed him and all of their valuables end up kind of just disappearing. But I think it's the product of just being underpaid for kind of challenging work. And just, just an apathy as well. I, I went to take, after I'd left the home, I, I went to take one of my ladies out for lunch and it really perked her up and I brought her back and um, as I sort of wheeled her in, she was all in, in good spirits and she said to the to the carer, oh, we, we had this and it, it, was, it was so nice and it was really, and this carer just broke through it with, do you need the toilet? Oh. And, you know, it's just that kind of attitude, not yeah. really seeing people as people. Yeah. So they can be perfectly physically well cared for, be kept clean and fresh and uh, proper, properly medicated cream and everything, but have absolutely no human contact. Yeah. No conversation. It's um, that that's what's so upsetting. That's why I like to do home care, really, because I was completely on my own then uh. with people. I would go in and I would have half an hour to spend just with someone I'd get to know. Uh, what they liked, how, yeah. how they wanted their tea, how they liked to dress. And, you know, you can sort of perk up, uh, make a day start well for someone. Yeah. It makes such a difference too, because in those environments, I find their their brains just go to mush. A lot of it is because there's not any stimulation whatsoever. And they'll be just, I watched my friend deteriorate over the course of a, a long time, up in many, many, three or four years from when he went in. And it was just wheeling him out into the, you know, common room, making him kind of eat and then wheeling him outside where, and this is the amazing thing about something like recovery is that there was a group of men and they brought a meeting to him every single Wednesday. It was a, a men's meeting and they met every, and it was his favorite part of the week. He looked so forward to it. And then he had a rabbi who came in once a week and sat with him. And it was amazing to see how many people in primarily recovery and religious organizations do actually show up at those places and try and make them a little bit more exciting or just give them that human feeling, I think, because they get just shuffled around. Absolutely. And I worked um, helping out the uh, Humanist UK mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, society, uh, social program, mm -hmm. and, and they mm -hmm. send um, carers, uh, they, they send humanists, but they call them chaplains in some contexts, but really they're, they're people who, who go out into to prisons, care homes, hospitals, and talk to non-religious people about how they're, how they're feeling, how their uh. well-being is. And I think, especially in somewhere like the UK, where, where more than half of us don't have a religion, they, those uh, sort of elderly people might not feel like they want to talk to a vicar or a rabbi or an imam. They, they might want a, a non-religious person. So I, I think that's a very good cause to get behind, can yeah, make a real difference. It can. And so you were in that for 17 years. Did you go to school after this? Yes. Okay. And what made you decide to go to school? Well, I'd got into an, a nice routine with my, my clients in my own area and I was cycling around um, around a sort of Epping Forest. And then um, something happened with my uh, ne strange neurological condition that I have. And I had uh, suffered some paralysis down one side and my eye turned in and I was in a lot of pain and dizziness. And I, I couldn't get on my bike. I couldn't work. 
And so I, I really had to spend most of my time sitting or lying down for a couple of years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So in that time, I decided to do what I'd always said I was going to do. I was going to go and do a degree in English literature. Mm -hmm. So I got in touch with my local university and I said to the, ask them if I, I said, I can, I can get about short distances. Sometimes, sometimes I can't. Is that going to be okay? They said they would waive the requirement for attendance oh, wow. for me and I, I managed to keep it up. I had to take six months out um, when it had a particularly bad phase, but otherwise I managed to get through it. Wow. And then I, I did I came out of that with a with a first. So I went on to do my masters in um early modern literature, which was thirteen hundred to seventeen hundred. So that's late medieval really, which is the period I was I was interested in. And why are you interested in that period? I like because it was a really sort of rich and exciting period for religious development you know in the in the 14th century and, and part of the 15th century we had the, the mystics mm -hmm. there was this um in catholicism because i'm looking very much at the the uk so um this sort of period is is catholicism Re reformation obviously happens later and that's why i, I like looking at that period because mm -hmm. i like to look at the different ways in which um women negotiated various narratives and how that changed over the reformation Oh. So I was interested in the late medieval period in how, in what different ways women um, looked at religion to the way men did. Oh, what were the biggest things that you noticed? I, I think, I mean, because there's such a small sample of women writers and a lot of writers, we don't even know what sex they were because it was considered, um, it, it wasn't, it was a pride to sign things. So right. sometimes we have to guess, but with a lot of the, the women writers, you see, more of a a sort of communal um sort of almost mystical thing with with the men there's often a sort of much more codified right way of looking religion that here's here's 10 rules you know here's his seven tenets and with women there's much more of a sort of wide ranging sort of narrative mm -hmm. arc to it mm -hmm. and and then obviously that there's a lot of um a lot of exceptions to that there's uh, very many male mystics who were were not sort of codified and and rigid in, in that way either but um i liked particularly um at marjorie kemp mm -hmm. one of the religious writers of um, the early 15th century and she was a very very interesting character because her book it it disappeared it was written i think in in 14 17 or some, something like that I've forgotten now but um it disappeared until the 20th century wow so all that remained were some quotes from it which had been taken by Winkin de Word during the um, renaissance and published and it was just really quite a, a normal boring sort of meditations but when the rest of the book turned up the other two thirds what it is is a fascinating social history ah. and so the rest of it is very worldly and she's talking about um she, she was really quite a petty woman and uh -huh. so she's talking about her squabbles <laughs> with other women her competitiveness <laughs> i love this with them yeah the way she'd like to argue with she wanted to argue with men mostly and she was very very good at arguing mm -hmm. so she set up these battles she had these battles she recorded them gleefully <laughs> you know, and she's she's a very and that we see now why um that that had been cut out because right. they wanted her as a holy woman they didn't want this very very human and vengeful really, yeah quite, quite high maintenance woman i i think i think now we, we'd consider her to have a histrionic personality disorder uh. or, or something along those lines but uh, it must have been so hard to be a woman back then it, it's crazy to think about one of my favorite movies ever is dangerous beauty have you ever seen this movie i haven't it's about um this she's a real woman she was a poet and a courtesan and she um, had all of these powerful men and it was in, I guess, probably the 1400s maybe in Venice. Mm -hmm. And I could be getting the date wrong. And she basically, her name was Veronica. I can't remember her last name. I interviewed the guy who directed the movie, Mar Marshall Herskovitz. He also did like My So-Called Life and 30 something and all of these very pop cultural shows that were phenomenons. But this movie was so formative because it was fascinating to me that the courtesans were the only women who were allowed to learn. They were the only ones who were allowed to go into the libraries at this in this time period. And the wives were essentially just breeding factories and they couldn't. And it was just a fascinating glimpse into 
the options women had as opposed to now just none really (laughs) Mm. yeah and i mean certainly at this time it it, i mean most people couldn't read or write obviously but there was a sort of moral um a moral issue around women being able to read but it's it's still very hard to sell say how many women could read or write Mm. i mean sort of a you know either merchant class or aristocratic women because it's often recorded as illiterate if they didn't read or write latin Oh. So in in it they could have been able in England obviously to to write in English and and it's probably it's probable that more could more of the sort of merchant class women could because they mm. needed to write lists they mm. needed to to write recipes and, and ways to to do things so but we think that Marjorie Kemp um, couldn't write but there's there was also a phenomenon where women were able to read but not to write oh. and while we learn these things at the same time and you might think well, how can someone read but not write that makes sense unless you're actually taught the grammar in a particular way you do end up being able to read things but not not write them mm-hmm. so um, and obviously a lot of things were also written in latin if they were considered a bit salacious or a bit risky so mm-hmm. that women in the working classes couldn't read them at all oh. so uh, we think that um that marjorie kemp she she talks of having two scribes to oh. write her books and she was read too a lot because she was a very wealthy woman so she quotes a lot of books but she probably probably couldn't write herself what was why was she so wealthy well, she was the daughter of John uh, Bert John Brunham, who was the um, sort of head merchant of King's Lynn, which was just called Lynn at that time. And this was a, a very interesting time. It was just after the Black Death. Mm. So there was more economic ach- opportunities. Uh, the whole sort of economy changed because there was suddenly half what to two What year was that? Uh, the Black Death was, it was 13 mm-hmm. sort of 70s. Okay, yeah, this was around the same time that this, um, the dangerous beauty movie is because it was that was a whole part of the movie yeah and then she gets called a witch and then all the men come to her defense i see yeah so because <laughs> the black death hit different countries at different times right so i think it was a 1400 i don't know i'd have to look yeah that that's interesting so there were more economic opportunities because so many people were dead and <laughs> he was very very powerful john brunham mm-hmm. and he um at, at one point had a war against um the monarchy and a war against the bishops and mm-hmm. um, because of his powerful status he um, well he he fell in the end but he he lived out his life but marjorie she managed to go through her life and this again you see this is a patriarchal society she had power she inherited her father's money her own husband seems to have agreed that it was hers she could do what she wanted with it which is not commonly understood mm-hmm. to be the case then but when she went through her life and she was going around and she was talking about religion and she was having big religious sort of ecstasies all over the place and this got her arrested quite a lot and she would just cite the name i am the daughter of john run and and that would yeah wow that that would be the way that she was um, a trust fund baby yeah (laughs) essentially she was and and what what were her what are religious ecstasies when you say that what does that look like um, there's sort of screaming, crying, sort of tearing at her clothes, falling on the floor, writhing around. Looks uh-huh. like, you know, having a seizure mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or something like this. I, the, the, um, the, what I, my work on it, I, I was comparing it to the current Pentecostals. Okay. To some extent. Somebody, um, else, I think it was, um, uh, Nicole Clan had done that already, but I wanted to look at that in, in more, um, detail because what people, the mistake people tend to make when they're looking back, at writing like Marjorie's, and they're very secular people, they're suspicious of it. They, well, how can she have such a practical merchant's wife's life at one point, and then in another be writhing around on the floor? One of these has got to be fake. Mm-hmm. And that isn't how religion worked in that time. People were both deeply religious and very practical. There uh-huh. wasn't seen to be this contradiction between the worldly and the spiritual that we see now. And interesting. People really had to do both. And of course, many, many didn't. That we, we don't know that any atheists existed um, specifically, but we do know people existed who sort of lived as though they didn't have much faith, who had to be nagged to go to church, who didn't speak about religion. But mm-hmm. And why were you so interested? You're an atheist, correct? Yes. And why are you interested in the reli- this particular um, women in religion and how that is all connected. Well, this this all started when I I was um, both a feminist and a Christian, 
And so I became, my, my parents were both atheists, mm -hmm. but I um, used to stay at my friends and we used to go to Sunday school on a, a Sunday. And, and in um, UK schools, they have Christian worship. So I became a Christian when I was seven. There's no separation of church and state. In, no. Right. Okay. You, parents do have the right to keep their children out of um, uh, religious uh, sort of assemblies, but then they miss so much else. So okay. my parents didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I became a Christian and um, I started to read the Bible at nine. I had myself baptized at 11 and confirmed at 13. Mm -hmm. And because I'm, I tend to go deeply into things, I'd, I'd read the Bible in um, entirely by the time I was 13. Oh my gosh. Um, for, well, four times by the time I was 13, apart oh from number, numbers, obviously, and you know, things that didn't have a. And then I started to Did read you a lot. read it of, in Latin? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> at 13. <laughs> I started to read a lot of theology as well mm -hmm. and go to a lot of Bible study and theological classes and I, I got very, very into it. So ah. um, even though I, I, it made me quite unwell anyway, because I was so worried that my parents were atheists and they were going to go to hell. Oh, what were you, you were t explaining this to me. What is it called? A, a literal... Um, I, I suffered, I was diagnosed with, with um, religious intrusive thoughts and scrupulosity. What is that? Well, it, it's a kind of OCD. So when, when you have OCD, there's an obsessive component and there's a compulsive component. Mm. So the people who have the obsessive component have thoughts that they just can't let go of and they're not right. helpful. Hypochondria and, is like this too. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And um, compulsive people have to perform certain actions. So I had a kind of OCD, which was very, very strong on the obsessive kind and so I would be trying to make sense of the Bible, trying to make sense of theology. Like one thing that worried me an awful lot when I was about 14 was um, that I, I kept fearing that I had, um, I had doubted the Holy Spirit. Now, doubting the Holy Spirit is the one sin that cannot be forgiven. Uh -huh. So um, that means you're going to hell. So I, what is this? It's a lack of faith, actually. So I worried about this a lot. And then I saw that um, Martin Luther had had the same worry. And he'd driven himself mad with it. I am absolutely convinced he had OCD. Uh -huh. But his solution was, he said that um, to dwell on this possibility all the time was really very simple. It was doubting the Holy Spirit itself. You have to just have faith. You need to right. stop worrying. It's actually a sin to worry. Right. And that saying something like that to a person with OCD, you know, it's... Um, it, it made me very, very ill. So I, I got... I was extremely underweight a lot of the time and I was... Um, um, self-harming and I was um, I, I went into hospital a few times to try and, and deal with it so wow. yes it wasn't very pleasant but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy I it's it's just so young to be that um literal you, or that just cri that amount of critical thinking and it, it was my death I guess <laughs> My brain was trying to make sense of it I needed to make it all work and I needed to know what what to do and I couldn't. It, there were there were too many contradictions, and there was too much um, doubt and uncertainty. Whereas, you know, my my friends and the the people, the Christians who tried to advise me, were had a much more relaxed sort of just trust God, just you know, right, just just have faith, enjoy life, and, and I I couldn't do that because I needed to know is this true? Can I survive the death of my brain and go on to either be tortured eternally or eternal bliss? Because that really kind of matters, right? And <laughs> you're like, clearly, you guys don't believe any of this. Actually, <laughs> if you're so just lackadaisical about it, <sighs> because you're right. If people, if if we all did really truly believe the word of the Bible, we would probably be a lot more anxious than we are. And day-to-day yeah. -day life i mean I, I see people that they're making plans for their pension they're worried about their old age they're, they're making sort of very complicated plans but when you ask them you know that they they don't seem to have really given much thought to the possibility that they might go to hell even though they're considered christian cons yeah uh -huh. and of course it was a big worry for me because my my parents were both non-believers so you were worried that they were going to burn eternally and yeah. you were going to be one of the, the children's <laughs> Bible I had, one of the first ones, it um, it had a picture of people in heaven um, feasting while watching people burn in hell. Oh, my God. Why did your... So what's really interesting to me is that did your parents push back against any of this? 
My my dad tended to he he was just extremely busy all the time. My mum, I think she took the wrong tack really. What she said was the the completely correct liberal thing, which was it's okay for you to have this belief, but you mustn't try to push it on me. I don't want to hear about it. You believe what you want, I'll support you with that. You can go to church. Don't push your religion on me. So that's fine, I think, when it's two adults talking, but I was really getting quite unwell with this. Right. <laughs> I really believed that she and my dad were were destined for hell unless I could fix them. Right, right. I had this one thing. There was um, a little jade Buddha in my parents' house, mm. and that was a, an idol. It was mm. sinful. Mm. And I wanted, I begged them to get rid of it. And I, <laughs> my mum got quite annoyed. <laughs> I love you so much. More and more, <laughs> I just love you. I just love <laughs> You just remind me of um, I was I was a weird little kid too, just, <laughs> just a weirdo, and I had this. I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast yet, but I had a moment kind of like this. I mean, it sounds like you had a bit of an existential crisis. Oh yes, <laughs> and I was in the woods, probably ten years old, and hiking through Connecticut, and there are all those colonial gravestones that are just randomly scattered throughout the woods and I stumbled upon one I don't know why I was allowed to just go in the woods by myself but there was a whole you know John beloved father husband brother and I have an active imagination so I imagined his whole life and I was like what was it like and this guy and I'd been learning we probably were learning about the colonial era people at that time so I had vivid images of this man with his kids and and then I was looking at the dates and then I noticed the dash between the two dates and I became aware that everything that I imagined in this whole guy's life just came down to that one little couple of inches. And then I became aware that I was in my little couple of inches and I was inconsolable. I went home and was crying to my parents. I was like, we're in the dash, we're in the dash. They're like, what do we do with this kid? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with you. They were like, what are you talking about? We're in the dash. So like, I couldn't conceive. I just had a moment of awareness of like how stupid it all is. I think I, I remember having that, becoming aware of my own mortality. <laughs> yeah. And I, my, my daughter did as well. And she, she was, I think it took her about six weeks not to cry every single night and ask, <laughs> why do we have to die? And what's being dead like? And yeah. Oh, it's a it's a huge thing, and I think <laughs> I mean if, huge thing. You know, if you if you read um, Jim's life in light of death, it's uh, it's something that we really go through our lives trying not to think about mm, mostly, or, yeah. or having some nice sort of simple uh, resolution to this, like like heaven or like like a, a legacy, or you know, and then we we just don't think about it, right? And it, it's very difficult to for humans be sort of complex, big brained apes to actually accept that yes we're mortal and and yes that that's okay when you know bereavement is so painful and death is so final it is and i was saying actually when peter and i were out looking at the stars we were talking about this and when you look up at the stars you just it's that immediate perspective and how small you are and how fleeting this all is and you know we had just been so petty and talking about twitter five minutes earlier and and I, then we were getting, we got into a conversation just about how pettiness is almost a defense against, I was like, if I was in this awe and awareness, I wouldn't be able to function. I, I have to forget that we're just on a rock in space and a grain of sand and like a blink of an eye, it's all over basically. And I do feel like, cause he, I, he's like, God, I just, I look, he said this on the podcast, he's like, I look at the stars and I just think, you know, I want to just cash out and I want to just play video, pay, play Dungeons and Dragons and do jujitsu. And I was like, the, you look at the stars and realize, like, I want to spend more time playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> but I get, I understand that, that kind of need to make it simple. Mm. And I also understand. So for me, I have like the stupidest explanations for things because I believe in past lives only because it's interesting. Because you can't prove to me that they don't exist, I just choose to believe in them because I feel like it's more interesting than them not existing. And so until someone says definitively, no, Bridget, there's an absolutely no such thing as past lives and we have proof, I'm <laughs> like, well, it's just a better story. Well, I, I think neuroscience really could could answer that one, but... Um, <laughs> You're like, I don't want to pull, <laughs> pull the <laughs> raft out from under you. <laughs> What would neuroscience say? 
Well, it will show how your your brain has <laughs> evolved. Is different, has its own unique pathways. How it's much of it relies on genetics, and how it's different to every other brain ever. And that the brain is who you are. But then, where does that think that little spark go when you die? Well, sometimes it goes before you die. As uh, you, if you've worked with people with oh, yeah, Alzheimer's, yeah. you know it. It can slowly, slowly die and, and leave the person as a as a shell, or which I think would be better. It can get snuffed out quickly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> going a blaze of glory. That's mm. my my hope. That's interesting. I I should probably study more neuroscience. <laughs> I think I'll just lean into my belief in past <laughs> lives. We don't want to be causing an existential crisis. <laughs> I go downstairs and I'm just crying. I'm like, Helen destroyed all of my beliefs <laughs> in nothing. Because <laughs> I don't really believe in anything. It's just like, whatever's interesting, guys. Whatever's cool, man. Uh, I think I find the idea of ceasing to exist a, a lot easier than many other people do because I spent so many years fearing hell. Right. <laughs> so, you know. So nothingness is, is a relief. Yeah, just yeah. stopping. That's something I can... That's funny. Bill Burr, I, I, I'll have to send it to you sometime. He has an amazing stand-up routine about all the stuff that he was taught by religion and how he just kind of let it go. But he was talking about how he went somewhere in one of the Nordic countries and they just believe in nothing. You know, and he's like, that's fucking terrifying, like nothing. But then just the idea of have, heaven and hell, he's like, imagine you go to heaven and then you're just waiting around. You're like, what's taking everyone so long? And then you realize they're all burning for eternity. Mm. And he does great bits about just the craziness of religion and how confusing and conflicting it is. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. I've had some experience in my life as the former Playboy advisor and woman about the town. Gentlemen, you need to do some grooming down there. It is not only women who need to take care of their privates and make sure they're nice and trimmed and looking fabulous for their next viewing. Because you never know, and you wanna be prepared. That's why this revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their Lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin-safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or snag your man's nuts. Men, listen up. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. Cleanliness wins the way to my heart. The modern man manscapes in a hygienic way. Don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. That's disgusting. And let's talk about the stinky balls. Can we please? We all know how sweaty balls smell. And if you don't know how sweaty balls smell, I hope you never have to. That's why Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. Men, you already put deodorant on your armpits hopefully, and if you don't, please start doing that. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest parts of your body? And these products smell good. Their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood, unlike that stanky smell, which immediately kind of does takes away from the mood. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. Ladies, this is the perfect gift for you and your man. And trust me, he will thank you. And men, your balls will thank you. And more importantly, your lady will thank you. So guys, get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code WALKIN. So when did you kind of officially become an atheist after all of th all of this? Um... I, I stopped being able to believe at, at 16. And I, I was in church and I was just listening and, and I, it just, well, how do we actually know this is true? I remember that thought just coming into my head and then... I started to to read a lot more different things to try and and strengthen my belief, and it just kind of slipped away like sand. Yeah. But I, although I'd I I couldn't believe anymore, I couldn't entirely not believe either. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of stuck in this um, in this place of, but what if it's true? Purgatory. And if it is true, I'm I'm now an atheist and I'm going to hell. So I've got to try and believe, and then I try to believe, and I couldn't believe, and then I'd I'd worry again about what if it was true. And so I read. Um, 
at my, my sort of late twenties, I think that was when they came out in my thirties was that new atheist moment. Mm -hmm. And so I read, um, Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. and Sam Harris, mm -hmm. Michael Shermer, mm -hmm. and he, Michael Shermer on the brain was actually very, very useful to me. It got over my fear of hell. Okay. And then there was that guy called Peter Bogosian and his manual for creating atheists. So ah. I put those four books as the ones that. Com that that got me over it. I mean, I, I, after I was about 16, 18, it got gradually better. I stopped having the fears. They got further and further apart. But it was when I was, um, it was a day that um, somebody had predicted that the world was going to end, some religious group. Mm -hmm. And I was walking my dogs over the field and the sun went in at the very same time as a helicopter came over. Mm -hmm. And so I just, oh my God, it is, it's the rapture. And I, <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, you've been an atheist for like, 15 years yeah. now <laughs> and that was when I really had to sort of give it give it more thought and stop the sort of um intuitive irrational fears mm -hmm. from from intruding yeah it gets put in your brain so young a lot of it for me I was catholic so before you can even evaluate those beliefs you're just taught them and I just believed them and so I always kind of say I'm a recovering catholic because there's so much guilt and around sexuality and all all the stuff that comes with that being squirted into my brain at, before I was even, I guess, first and second grade in kindergarten. I went to a private Catholic school and had nuns. And I mean, they even tried to make me a righty, but my parents, thank goodness, pushed back against that. It's, I don't know that I'm still over it, that I'm, I'm over it, but I don't know how much of it lingers kind of in my subconscious mm. in my cells or where, wherever it lurks so you you were studying feminism uh, i was i was a feminist you're a feminist so, yeah my mother was a, a second wave liberal feminist okay and um she came to london at the age of 18 and she worked for lloyd's bank um weren't, women weren't allowed on the um the bank floor itself uh -huh. and they weren't allowed to take accountancy exams uh -huh. and so she um she complained about that okay and she wrote things about that and she marched and um she did all the all the feminist things particularly when it, in the 70s she uh, wanted to get a mortgage and she couldn't get one without a male guarantor her father had just died she wasn't on good terms with her brother she just couldn't get a mortgage wow so she was that kind of feminist and she still describes herself as a feminist mm -hmm. and so i was a feminist too mm -hmm. and i was very much a liberal feminist so in the 90s when i sort of started out into the sort of working world I, I was very much a feminist, but it was a it was a really optimistic, positive kind of feminism then. It was that sort of sisters are doing things for themselves mm -hmm. feminism. Mm -hmm. So we'd assumed that we had essentially won, but we were just dealing with some attitudes. Right. So my first boss, um, he was a, a, a much older man, and, and he said to me, oh, well, you are a clever girl. And I said to him, thank you. I think you're a clever boy. And so it was that kind of, of humorous sort of pushback. Right. And so he sort of uh, laughed uncomfortably about that, but he didn't call me that again. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and, and in the UK, it was quite common for, for men to call women birds. Mm -hmm. And so I would, um, if they did call me that, I would just say cheap until they addressed me properly. Mm -hmm. So you said there was a, there was a kind of cheeky yeah mm -hmm. there was a bolshiness there was um an aggression there but it was friendly mm -hmm. we didn't think people were evil we didn't want them punished cancelled fired mm -hmm. we just wanted to point out when right there was something a bit sexist going on i don't even think they realize it half the time no so uh, by this time by my my 20s then i was yeah i was i was an atheist but i was very well read in um christian theology right and um and the whole sort of christian narrative and i also had a feminist uh focus so when i wanted to go and study literature i wanted to look at women's history i wanted to look at women's religious history cool when did you start noticing that that there was this kind of corruption occurring in the in the what are they called again? The, the like cultural, yeah, cultural studies, studies. media studies, mm -hmm. yeah, literature everywhere they they pop up. It was I understood it um, better when I got there. If because I'd been reading a lot of the new atheists, the sort of postmodern thing had come up, and I'd I had an understanding of the basics of how it worked mm -hmm. because they were critical of that too. But my very first um, first year as an undergraduate, it was there was the ways of reading 
thing. And with that was when we were taught literary theory. And mm-hmm. from that point onwards, we either had to read things through a uh, feminist, uh, Marxist, post-colonial, queer, uh, any of these kind of um, theoretical lenses. Mm-hmm. So we weren't really allowed. They, they were very... Um, they, they, they condemned uh, liberal humanism. The, the very first course was why liberal humanism is bad. Why do they think it's bad? Because they thought it was simplistic. They thought it was this kind of self-congratulatory um, white man thing. Can you define liberal humanism for people? Yeah, well, in this sense, when we're talking about literary tradition, because if we're talking about liberal humanism more broadly, that's that's generally the view of your average sort of secular liberal. So that's not exactly what I'm talking about. In um, liberal humanism, we're, we're talking about people like um, Eliot and uh, Levis, this whole sort of the great tradition people. Mm-hmm. So they... Um, were really modernist, but they, and, and hang on, I don't want to go into the weeds here. So they, they are known as the modernists and they are the people who came before the postmodernists. Okay. So the modernists had some traits of postmodernism in which they started to become a bit doubtful. They didn't do everything in straight lines. They wanted to explore things. They were interested in psychoanalysis and all that kind of thing. But they still believed that there was good and bad literature, that there was um, that, pe- that there was a certain sort of level of human perfection that you could get to, that you could look at um, literature from everywhere through a universal human lens and um, sort of judge it morally. Mm-hmm. So the liberal humanists there, I mean, they there there is some validity in saying that they were very much a Western um, phenomenon. Right. They did tend to think that the reader was a man. Mm-hmm. They did tend to think that the um, West was the pinnacle of, of science and reason, and the the East was quite sort of um, you know superstitious. And right. So so that was there is that problem with the liberal humanists. But on another level, they also. They, they also spoke to universals. They, they did readings of the text as it is. They were interested in what the read, what the writer, um, believed and what it could tell us about humans, how, what wisdom it could give us. Right. So that, you know, that, that is something that I think it's a shame to entirely lose because at this point we then got, um, Roland Barthes who spoke about the death of the author. We no longer care what the author meant. We're looking at how we interpret things culturally and how different people in different cultures interpret things differently. Mm-hmm. So this is where we're getting the, the shift to the postmodernism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, the liberal humanists, we, we were just we, one of our exams was essentially why liberal humanism is bad and, and then pick another couple of theories and why they're good. So the, it was very it was very difficult to sort of do any kind of empirical work or or humanist work then if we're analyzing literature i would always want to come at it from what was technically a feminist angle because i was really interested in how women's roles were in this time that's the point of historic literature right for me what were women doing what were they saying right but it was getting increasingly difficult to do that without a specific lens which focuses on the core ideas like patriarchy like the male gaze right and so it, it's it's shallow. It's very shallow. Whereas I I see in um, in history a much a much richer role for women. Mm-hmm. I see them as having more um, power in the social realm mm-hmm. than is is understood. I I see them having more power in in the home in relationships. Mm-hmm. I don't see them as these kind of uh, I don't know sort of then they weren't these sort of placid non entities mm-hmm. and. I, they were suffering under patriarchy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this is where I think we have to have this line. Women were living in a patriarchal society. This doesn't mean that they were oppressed by men every minute of every day, because, you know, we, we have to look at a society as how the worst people behave in it. So if we looked back at history, the history of men and women, we're going to find that in the majority of cases, men loved women and they wanted them to be happy. Right. So women could have a good life under a patriarchal system as long as they didn't want um, any kind of um, ruling power. Right. And as long as they got a good husband. If they were a brilliant 
person with great sort of aptitude for science, they were screwed. Right. If they married a bastard, they were screwed. Right. So it's a terrible system. Right, right. But that doesn't mean we should read history in this simplistic way of, of let's read this text and see how women are oppressed in it. I've always said this with literally no evidence other than the <laughs> fact that we're here, but writing for Playboy and stuff, I, I always push back against this idea that all men are bad. I'm like, if all men were bad, we wouldn't be here. Just as a as a species, I cannot think that all men were murderous rapists because they. I think in general, their inclination is to protect women and children for by the most of the time, and there are the roving gangs that don't. And the but I don't think it's the majority of men. No, Brett Weinstein um, explains to me how this is impossible in evolutionary terms because genes will go on from men to be either male or female. Mm. They just, genes can't develop in which men um, try to improve their own situation at the expense of women's. Mm, they can't be, men and women cannot be at war with uh, each other in the species. So. Well, we are currently. Yeah, see, that. Uh, who was it? Was it Eleanor Roosevelt who said that um, the, the gender wars will never really go anywhere because there's too much fraternizing with the enemy? Oh, <laughs> that's funny. So then when you were studying and t- noticing this, do you think that it was your deep grasp and OCD about religion that made you recognize that there this is somewhat of a religion being kind of presented as a fact yeah i mean i i had come by that time i I was very interested in critical thinking in in reason in science i was reading a lot about 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 epistemology about ethics how do we know what is true can uh, is that the definition of epistemology yes a lot of people including myself i've just started to get my mind around this word despite looking it up probably hundreds of times and but i need to, i need to understand it in context so i feel like i get it you more. could very simply replace the word epistemology with the word knowledge mm-hmm. and it would still work people will know what you're you're talking about so uh, but different, it's different not really kinds knowledge, of knowledge really it's more how you know things yeah how do you, how do we how do you know what is true how do we decide what is true so in the medieval period the um sort of benchmark for truth was divine revelation it was religion right then over the modern period we have moved gradually towards science and reason we think things are true if there is evidence for them. right okay so that is the epistemology of that time the postmodern epistemology um says we only rely on evidence and reason as the benchmark for truth because we have a society that's constructed that and that society works in the service of straight white men. So what is that epistemology then? Well, it's is um, it experience? Yeah, it's a standpoint epistemology. Now that doesn't only belong to postmodernism. The most um, influential scholar of this is is um as a Marxist feminist that I'm thinking of, but within postmodernism, yes, this epistemology is about um position in society. So we imagine that society is made like a grid and it's a power grid and there are systems of power and privilege and you're born and you're a woman Mm -hmm. so you're going to go quite low down but you're also white so you're going to be a higher up than a black woman and i'm in america so yep colonial yep so so there you are you're you're in this um complex relation to power in which you will speak in ways as a white american woman now, in those ways that you speak, you will be unintentionally, probably, reinforcing whiteness and imperialism. And the patriarchy. Yep, you can enforce the patriarchy as well, but you also have the ability to see things that um, men don't right. if you become woke to them. Right. And then you can um, talk to power from that. So, that it's angle. All, so the epistemology of this time is really just the a power structure? It's just power? Yeah, it's power and dynamics. It's, it's language. Mm. So the idea that um, that dominates postmodernism is that knowledge is a stru- is a construct of language. Okay. So if there is the dominant belief that men should be dominant and women should be submissive, then this is policed and monitored by language. And it's not just how men speak to women; it's how women speak to men, women speak to women, and men speak to men. And because we have this expectation, we accept it as true. It's this power is sort of perpetuated on all levels of society, whether it's the, the president of the United States or a, a 12-year-old on Twitter. 
they're speaking into this same discourse. And so we have the social justice people now who are trying to unpick this discourse. They're trying to deconstruct it, although they don't often use that term now. That was one of the earlier postmodern terms, but it is what they're trying to do. When they, when the word woke comes up, it, 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 it describes becoming more aware of this power structure and being able to see it. So within the context of all of these power dynamics, where I start getting tripped up is all of the gender stuff and the gender fluidity, because it seems like a lot of those things kind of come into conflict with one another. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly do. But when the, the whole sort of queer theory um, basis, that's, that's the one that says that um, there is no binary between men and women, male, masculine and feminine, um, gay and straight, and that there is no correlation between being female and being feminine and being attracted to men. So this is the, the one that really wants to blur all the boundaries because it feels that by doing this, it liberates people who don't fit in those simple binaries or, or sort of clusters. So that is mm. that has become very dominant, and it's pushed out the earlier radical feminism. Okay. And so it's the radical feminists who believe that also, they also believe gender was a social construct, but they believe it was a construct of a male class to oppress a female class. So they're maintaining the binaries. Okay, yeah, I get called ter a turf a lot. Yeah. Which is a, for my listeners who don't know, it's a trans exclusionary radical feminist. Yeah. But it's just because I always make jokes when I see things about the sports or or um, when you have a trans woman who's winning a sports event, I'll always make a joke, the patriarchy is so crafty. And that's kind of my my line, I'll say the patriots are the patriarchy is so crafty they'll turn themselves into a woman so so that they can beat women at their own game. Yeah, see radical feminists will say that completely seriously. <laughs> yeah, I learned that. <laughs> uh, that. This is the strange thing about them. I've I've seen some of the memes that they've made, radical feminists, when they say that trans activists are MRAs and then they put together the MRAs sort of, are men's rights activists. Yes, yep. men's rights activists. So they'll put together their speaking points with trans people's um, activist speaking points. Uh -huh. And they really do believe that this is a conspiracy on the part of the patriarchy to get <laughs> men into women's spaces. You live in the craziest <laughs> times. Yeah. So I, I'm, you know, I can't agree with the radical feminists, obviously, but they are consistent in their beliefs. They, right. they don't have the contradictions. Where you'll see the contradictions in the, the sort of the kinds of feminism and social justice activism that comes from um, postmodernism is really in between queer theory and critical race theory or queer theory and post-colonial theory, because then you'll get the situation where you need to respect um, other cultures, uh, particularly ones that have been colonized and um, not um, moralized about their moral values, but you also need to support um, gay and trans rights. Right. So when we're looking at um, cultures, um, India, Pakistan, South Asian uh, particularly, they're often very socially conservative around LGBT rights. Right. So the good sort of social justice activists need to um, respect this, but they also need to respect LGBT rights and yell at anybody who isn't um, Eastern if they don't uh, support them. So right. that, that's where we get the mess. And then I see that, you know, the conflict that I've never really understood and I still have, I've, I've, I've asked people to explain this to me is that if gender and sex are a social construct, then why do people feel like they're in the wrong body or need to take hormones? If it's all just fake or made up, why, why do they feel like they're the wrong sex? Which is what I don't understand I don't understand. <laughs> and that's where those things come into conflict for me too. I like do. which which one is it? Now that's because that the gender as a construct works differently in the um radical feminist view and the intersectional feminist view, the postmodern mm -hmm. view. So that what you've just said there is exactly why the radical feminists cannot accept that anyone could be born in the wrong body and see it as either delusional or a conspiracy of some kind mm -hmm. because they really don't think gender exists. Okay. But with the um, the sort of queer theory approach, they think gender exists. So if we take Judith Butler, because she's at the 
the core of everything. When she's Who's got, Judith, but- Judith Butler? For Judith her. Butler is the um, writer of Gender Trouble, okay. 1990. Okay. And she is really considered the founder of um, queer theory. Okay. And from queer theory has come an awful lot of feminism and um, trans um, scholarship and all kinds of... So she really is a key figure and she's a Foucauldian. So she's using ideas of Michel Foucault, who is probably the most influential postmodern theorist. So she has this concept of performativity. And what this is different to performance, but the way it works is that people perform... Um, roles and they make them real so it isn't as the radical feminist said that gender just doesn't exist at all for her there is always a construct of gender but it is still constructed so what happens Uh... is you're, you're born and then as you learn to speak to walk to do whatever you also learn how to perform your gender okay and you can do it right and get positive feedback or you can do it wrong and get negative feedback Mm -hmm. and so you will then Um, learn how to do it and there are an awful lot of people who don't fit into this Mm -hmm. and they need to have the freedom not to right and so uh, you know someone someone saying i am a man because i have a penis is worth no more than someone saying i am i am a man because i feel like a man Mm -hmm. so they can perform for for butler it's all about subversion so you need to subvert these binaries Mm -hmm. and so you know, you self identity is is key there. Okay, okay. So this is where the self identifying stuff is, yeah, rooted. Although some of the recent trans activists have been annoyed with Butler because <laughs> she suggests that it is essentially um, a performance, and they feel that it's much more real than that. So she's okay. responded to them by saying, "I'm not meaning to say that your gender identity isn't real." <laughs> But um, <laughs> so you've gone very deep. There's this movie Rush, and it's about these heroin addicts, or they're police, and they go into to undercover with heroin addicts, and they get addicted to heroin. Basically, <sighs> at any point, w- was does your brain? Were, at any point, was it easier if you were just like, I should just swallow the Kool Aid and go all in? <laughs> You know, were you when you kind of were absorbing all of this and under really because you seem to have a really deep understanding of the theory, but you're you're not a believer in the theory, which is an anomaly because most people who have this depth of knowledge in terms of queer theory, fat studies, all all of the different what other ones are there? Disability studies, post-colonial studies, critical race theory, intersectional feminism. Yeah. So most people who have the knowledge that you seem to have, they are, they're activists or or they're, they're academics or they're writing about all of this very seriously, Mm. but you don't seem, you seem skeptical of it. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. You probably know you should be taking vitamins to help supplement your diet. But with so many options, how do you know which nutrients you need and which ones you're probably already getting enough of from your diet? That's why you need Ritual. Ritual is the obsessively researched multivitamin designed for women by women. Ritual contains nine nutrients that are difficult to get enough of every day, even with a healthy diet. Instead of taking a handful of five to eight vitamins, Ritual makes it easy with two capsules a day. Order online at Ritual.com. For around $1 a day, Ritual is delivered to your door monthly so you can stay on track with your new healthy habit. Ritual is traceable and transparent. Ritual search the globe for the best suppliers and is transparent about where they source their ingredients. If you want to know more, you can find everything on the website. Easy, all-in-one, everything I want. That's why Ritual is the daily multivitamin I choose. I have been taking Ritual for about three months now, and I've noticed a big difference in my energy level, particularly that it's just more steady. And I forgot to take it for a couple of days, and my energy in the afternoon crashed, and it may or may not be the vitamin, but it was definitely a noticeable afternoon crash that I hadn't been experiencing. I like how clean the vitamin is, And I like that I know all of the ingredients in the vitamins. It is so easy to find where all of them come from. And they're so transparent about everything that's in the vitamin. Try Ritual today because you'll get an exclusive offer for 10% off your first three months. 
This is a great deal. So visit ritual.com slash walk in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off your first three months at ritual.com slash walk in. So at what point did you, how did it come about that you decided to do the grievance studies? Where were you in your head and where were you kind of in your life? I, I'd been arguing against postmodernism for a, a long time. I mean, as, as you point out, it is very rare for um, anyone who doesn't believe it has any value to spend this amount of time reading it. Mm-hmm. So I am, I feel almost in a space of my own here. Mm-hmm. The other people who seem to know it as well um, but disagree with it are um, sort of materialists and they're the, the academics that come from the Marxist tradition. Okay. And so they have studied it because they're seeing it as a problem. But from me, from a liberal position, I, there's there's not a lot of people know who are doing this. But I, I find it interesting to look at ideologies and to see how they work and to play with them. That's right. the thing I really enjoyed when I was in undergraduate and postgraduate, applying these theories, because there's something very satisfying about that. You can connect all kinds of things. You can make claims. <laughs> it's it's really fun, but uh-huh. it's also nonsense. So when I had to write, I was I had a compulsory um, postmodern reading mm-hmm. to do, and I I did it, but I f- spent the first part a long introduction saying essentially why everything I'm about to say is crap. Right. And that's that's how we had to go. But yeah, when Jim and um, and Pete uh, said that they were thinking of uh, well, they had they'd started. Um, how did you meet them? I met um, I met Jim on Twitter. OK, we I disagreed. I thought I was going to disagree with one of his books. OK. And I argued with him about it. So the first conversation we have on Twitter is me telling him he's wrong and him saying he can't read things for me. I have to actually focus myself. So that was... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Jim. Yeah. So that was great. <laughs> But then, yeah, I, I read the book and I liked it and I did a positive review of it. And then I positively reviewed his second one. And we got into some interesting conversations and he decided, suggested we should write together. Okay. And because he and Peter were already writing together, uh-huh. it seemed, um, yeah, well, to sort of combine the three of us. So we, uh-huh. yeah, have been writing. Peter and I can't actually write directly together <laughs> because we're two different and we end yeah. up wanting to kill each other. But we can speak well together right. and we can write things and, which are then sort of um, reconciled via Jim. Right. So <laughs> He's the, the glue. <laughs> so you decided to do this and we had, I mean, anyone can go online and see what's kind of come of it. Now, my, what we, the conversation we were having the other day that's so interesting to me is that often what's happened to me is that I've reacted to this intuitively. I I don't have the depth of knowledge that you have about the theory at all. I didn't go to college. I wasn't exposed to it. I wasn't indoctrinated with it. I just kind of stumbled into it when I started writing a Playboy in 2015. <laughs> so it was like I woke up out of a coma and and theory had an intersectionality had taken over. And I just kept stepping in shit inadvertently without realizing that the culture had completely shifted around me because I was a 90s feminist. I'm 40, so I came up and it was like, yeah, girl power, awesome. Blowjobs are empowering. And then, no, they're not. I'm literally internalizing the patriarchy by doing this. And I am was accused uh, just all kinds of things. I would say things like real man, which it's just a expression. It didn't really, but got piled on for things like that. So I kept stumbling into it and then intuitively reacted to it, then started seeing bigger, I guess, patterns and ways that this played out all over. People started getting canceled. My comedian brethren started becoming woke and doing TED Talks instead of comedy, it became just all of a sudden it was everywhere. 2016 was this kind of watershed moment where everything polarized even more. And I felt like, you know, I get the criticism I get the most often is that I'm a reactionary. That's not an unfair criticism because I'm not necessarily saying I'm standing for anything. And I would a lot of people say that I'm creating a path to the right, that I'm not I'm not a true person who's really just independent and trying to figure it out because I'm I'm not creating any pathways to the left. But I still don't know how you can because I'm all for social justice. I want people 
I don't like the callousness I see sometimes on on the right. And I don't, I want people to thrive. And there is inequality that I think we should root out and fight. But how do you do that without being totally insane? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's the key right now. I like like you, I think the majority of people still do work on a a liberal and modern mindset. They do believe that science is the way to know things, the best way to know things. They do believe that arguments need to be reasoned. They do want a consistently liberal ethic opposed um, sort of on everything. So we, we don't want to switch from um, a society in which men are superior to women to one in which uh, men are men are scum and women are, are noble victims. You know, right. we want to have the same rules applied to everyone. And this is what I, I see a lot: is people responding to, um, to to sort of social justice ideas from a universal liberal perspective, and they're talking right past each other. Mm. So you know, people will quite often say, um, "Well, put black in there instead of white." That thing you just said, and that doesn't make any sense to a social justice person because they are seeing everything as systems of power. They've got different rules that apply. Mm. If you say, say something that would be racist if you said it about the black people, but isn't if you say it about white, that's perfectly consistent. Right. But this doesn't calculate. It doesn't doesn't make sense to the universal liberals, and so they keep coming at these with that intuitive. But this isn't fair. This isn't consistent. Right. This is hypocritical. What are you doing? Right. And they, do, you know, so they know that it feels wrong, but they're not um, they addressing don't understand it. The theory. The, yeah, they don't know mm -hmm. why it's happening like that. They don't know why the social justice people don't see that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that we need to do at the moment. And that's what I'm hoping Jim and Peter and I will put some time into doing is breaking down how the social justice um, ideas work and then articulating the objections that universal liberals have with them. So because that's the the what I'm trying to really define more and more, what am I standing for? So I feel like I'm standing in this void or as I've been saying to Jim, it's like we all exist, you, the four of us and a, a lot of other people, Brett and Heather Weinstein and uh, that in this tear in the social fabric where I don't really, I, it feels insane kind of everywhere. And it's very easy for me to be weaponized by the right. And I've always tried to push back against that. But every time I do something that comes out from the left and the, the stuff that comes from the left feels like so insidious in this fundamental way that we've all agreed to like due process and science evidence and science and taking words and making up new meanings. And this all feels for some reason much more terrifying to me than, than anything else. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater either. And I find that when I ask people who are describe themselves as center left and they say, now people who don't know the theory or anything or where you're coming from, just very pe simple people who they say, well, I'm a classical liberal because it's really what they've heard. But that's also what the center right is saying. So what is the difference between the center left and the center right from your perspective? What makes the center left? What is the pathway still to the Democratic Party, I guess, in this country? Mm, well, I, I think I'm probably better addressing leftist values and rightist values okay, rather that's than perfect. Democrats. And, and yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I think that's what I mean anyway. Yeah, because, okay, so... We have people saying um, that they're classical liberals. This can be understood um, often to mean a libertarian, uh, free market, right-leaning. Okay. So I, I used to call myself a classical liberal because I meant that I, um, I, I, uh, I adhered to the to the traditional sort of million liberal views. I wanted free speech. I wanted progress, but that isn't how it's seen. So what I think we're looking at now, when we have people who are close to the centre, but we have some who are leaning left and some who are leaning right, those people who are leaning right are really wanting to preserve 
certain aspects of what they often see as Western civilization. Right. So they might lean more towards um, socially conservative gender roles. Mm -hmm. They might um, want a smaller government, um, lower taxes. Religion. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they may well be religious and they don't, they're not, they're generally a little bit more suspicious of um, progress on the sense of sort of uh, equality issues. Mm -hmm. But they're they're usually they're usually very clear individualists mm -hmm. who um, want equal opportunities. They're they're not the far right who are saying that only white men right, should have them. Right. And then on the left, we've got the people who are sort of more influenced by some socialist views and some sort of social democratic views and liberal um, views. Again, so we have there we we've still got the people who want progress who aren't convinced that sexism and racism and homophobia has gone away who still thinks that's very important to address who are most likely to be extremely distressed by being called racist sexist mm -hmm. and they're more likely to want things like nationalized health care mm -hmm. and um, a larger government a better stronger welfare system mm -hmm. and and that kind of thing so they are the whole sort of left and right in terms of policies are still quite distinct right but when it comes to the big issues around really illiberal and irrational ideas, what we've got are the fringe on the left, which is is now quite science denying, which is um, it, it's really quite anti fairness, as you said, with the problems with things like due process and um, and freedom of speech, particularly in mm -hmm. the UK. Mm -hmm. So that that's very liberal. And on the the far right, we're seeing the rise of of populism, mm -hmm. which takes on a nationalistic tone that veers into racism, which supports gender roles and is um, it's really anti intellectual mm -hmm. as well. So we have the right wingers, and they're um, opposing the far left. Mm -hmm. As they, which they're seeing as the problems of the left mm -hmm. and the left wingers who are opposing the rising far right. So it's the extremes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're getting this polarization mm -hmm. in which people are being reacted. Of course. They're reacting to the extremes on the other side, which they see as an existential threat. And they're not doing what Jim and I said we think they should be doing in our manifesto against the enemies of modernity, which is to slow down, look at what your values are. So if you are not a fringe lunatic, you almost certainly believe in freedom of speech, mm -hmm. in, um, in science, in reason, and in a fair and level playing ground for everyone. Mm -hmm. If you believe in these things and strong institutions, then you are a modernist. Okay. You are not a postmodernist like the far leftists or a pre-modernist like the far right. Okay. And what you really need to do then is articulate these values, argue for them, and then the people on the right need to address them, the problems on their own side, mm -hmm. and the people on the left address the ones on their side. Mm -hmm. And that is how we get through it. But um, that's how we, we hopefully push those ideas out and marginalize them. But we need to know how to do this, how to address it. So if, if someone were to say to you, um, why do you as a white woman um, have the right to talk about this? How would you respond to that? <laughs> Probably reactively. <laughs> I mean, I, I wrote a very reactive piece to all of the white women come get your own. And I was basically like, I'm not doing this. So I just reject their theory entirely and, and essentially say I'm not playing this game and that intersectionality is, a, a, I understand there are things, again, I don't like to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that it, there are parts of it that are absolutely important to look at and true, but that doesn't mean that it should take over all aspects of every every part of our society and the cancel culture and not allowing people to make mistakes and and having these kind of mobs that come after people for the slightest mistake of of words i mean it's happening today with what's his name lopez so i i don't think i would respond to it in a way that presents me as somebody who's still center left or a or because i because i have been reacting to the extremes in my party but because the only people who will even talk to me are people on the right because the left has this the extreme left basically in order to defend that theory, there's no, as you know, it's very challenging. Essentially, if you even push back against the ideology, you're now carrying water for white supremacists. So, 
anyone who kind of pushes back against this gets called a racist or a bigot or so I don't know really how to effectively push back against it. I, 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 this is why I need you because <laughs> I don't want to go. It, it, it's, I've had people and I've, my cousin Maggie is one of them where I'm like, don't let me, it would be easy for me as a human who feels rejected. Being called a racist is the worst thing that you could be called by my own peers and comedy and people that I know I'm going to see. And, and it's easy. I have to watch myself to go just, you know, take the whole red pill down and go all in because I don't, I see the same craziness on, it's not where, where I come from anyway. I'm, I'm still, I still vote Democrat. You know, that's like the irony of it in many respects. And I just don't, I don't really know how, I don't know how to still fight for social justice and not be, and not be crazy. And yet the very first thing you said was the, the nub of it. The very first thing you said to why do you as a white woman have the right to talk about this was I don't accept that premise. Right. <laughs> and that, that, that is the key to it. But the way that that, um, you, you know, you don't accept the premise that people, can only speak to certain things if they have a certain identity. Right. And then you went on to say, but you don't want to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. So you do understand that um, people can have experiences of, uh, of that relate to their identity and that this isn't completely um, a terrible idea. No, and I do still see things where there's, you know, getting house where loans for houses. There's still inequalities out yeah. there that I want to address and fight. And then you were talking about all the rest of the awful abhorrent stuff that's tied in with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this is this is what I think people are doing when someone comes up to them and says one of these key phrases of social justice, their intuitions are exactly right. But then they're, they're, it sort of explodes outwards because there's so much to it. You know, the, the thing that I think we should all say if, if somebody says, um, who are you to talk about this as a man or whatever, is say, I don't accept your premise that knowledge is tied to identity. I can, I continue to evaluate arguments on their merits while recognizing people can have different experiences. So that wow. is. That's the that's the talking point. That's the liberal yeah. response to that, mm -hmm. you know. But of course, you then know that it's tied into so much other stuff, and then there's immediately the fear that I'm going to be lumped in with racists. I'm going to be be giving some kind of support to right wing views, mm -hmm. and it's also complicated and messy. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think we really need to articulate this strongly liberal, um, clear view so that it doesn't sort of shatter outwards into all of that leaving people unsure how to respond or whether they should just keep their mouths mm -hmm, shut mm -hmm. you know we need to find a way for people to say look i understand that you are concerned about marginalized groups in society you want social justice so do i your methods in which you're tying knowledge to identity you're deciding who can speak and who can't speak you've got different rules for different groups is not the way to achieve that we've got the same goals We've got different methods, and I think Alan's going to do it. And what were you saying to me about how, because I think that there's something really important about the the idea that the individual is still important and the common humanity and within what intersectionality has done, their method is to divide everybody up into groups, which is essentially creating this sense of tribalism that I think we're all feeling. And how do you, how do you, how would you say something along those lines? You said it so articulately the other day. I wish I had it on tape. I think, um, thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> it was just so, it so brilliantly articulated what the problem is. You know, what the, what, when you are taking all of these, when you're attaching social justice and knowledge to identity and turning it into all of these little groups and where they, the power structures lie you said you lose the individual and the common humanity. Yeah. And I think because if we think about the ways in which we relate to the world, we do really do this in three ways. We do it as a, a member of the human race. Mm -hmm. We do it as the member of a community and we do it as an individual. So when liberalism arose, it looked at the biggest and the smallest element of that. So it was saying that everybody, every ind the individuality is the important thing of the human. Every individual must have the ability to um, to take advantage of things, to grow, to develop. And so this uh, relies on a, a shared concept of humanity. We all have 
um, some something within this realm of abilities, we should all have access to what the world has to offer. Right. Now, sometimes this liberalism missed out on, adva- on advantages and opportunities that could be missed because of a social group that people were in. So it didn't always consider that working class people, that women, that ethnic minorities might face extra barriers. Mm-hmm. So as liberalism developed in the 60s to the 80s, you have people like Martin Luther King, who's specifically addressing that. He's saying, you know, I, you know, I want to be ju- I want my children to be judged by the continent of their character and not their skin color. Mm-hmm. So he is talking there to the individual and the shared humanity. Mm-hmm. But he is pointing out that the people who are held back are were African Americans. Uh-huh. And that was what feminism, uh, liberal feminism did as well. It didn't say, you know, that we are a group and you need to pay attention to us because we're this group. They said we are individuals and we are humans and we're not having the same benefits. Right. And that was gay pride. Right. To treat us as individuals and part of common humanity. And trans rights as well. Yeah. And this mm-hmm. is how this all worked within mm-hmm. the 60s to the 80s. It was an appeal to our liberalism, mm-hmm. our universal liberalism. Mm-hmm. So this liberalism in this way was already addressing its missing point where it was really quite blithely assuming that everybody had access to everything already. Right. And it was doing that well within the 60s to the 80s. But when postmodernism got adapted within intersectionality and the other kinds of theories, then it wanted to really focus on those groups. Mm. The thought was that mainstream liberalism was still too slow it, any gains that were made could just get swallowed up again by um, sort of social norms. And so the, the group identity really had to be pushed hard to the, to the detriment of individuality and um, universality mm. and shared humanity. Just, I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw said, at least now there is a value in universality, but right now we need to, to push identity politics. Mm. And I think that was a terrible mistake i think Mm. i think there was certainly still work to be done on behalf of identity groups but not with the identity politics aim you know if you're going for if you if you're appealing to people on their sense of fairness i am an individual i am a member of the human race and i don't have the same opportunities as you will you help me that goes down much better than if you're seeing yourself as a member of an oppressed group and you're railing at the oppressor group Mm -hmm. and looking at their privilege it's so hard, though, because I, I had tried to have these impossible conversations with some of my liberal friends, but they are completely bought, and maybe I'm wrong, but completely bought into the idea that uh, Western civilization is founded on white supremacy. Everything is a, everything is basically upholding that. I am up, I'm doing by not pushing back against it and trying to essentially reject my whiteness. I'm I'm just part of the problem, but I don't know how to, I can't make somebody see outside of that if they truly believe that that is, I don't know how to even have that conversation because I'm not educated enough in the history of, I just don't feel like, I feel like I would need to be armed with facts and figures. And even, even then, I just kind of reject the premise that I, somehow had control over being born white in the same way that I would fight for somebody who's being judged for being black or brown or any anything. I I have to fight for myself. But then that looks like white you know, no, like, see, that, that it again, looks like white supremacy. <laughs> I think look, what, what you're just again there, you're you're talking about universal liberalism. Right. You're applying your principles consistently across the board. <laughs> I don't think that you need to have an in depth knowledge of the history of these ideas and philosophical arguments around them. Okay. I think that people who don't have that background, which is nearly everyone, just has to have the confidence to say, No, I want consistent principles. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same principles to apply to everybody of every race. This Mm -hmm. doesn't mean I think we already have a level playing ground. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it can be achieved by having different rules for different groups. That's so good. So, you know, if you can, I don't think you will get through to the most um, zealous and um, sort of steeped in theory people Mm -hmm. that are arguing with you on that. But maybe some of the ones who are struggling. Yes, people, there are so many people out there who are generally liberal, who generally want racial LGBT gender equality but they don't want to be seen to be going against social justice so if there are other liberals there saying we want this too but you're doing it wrong Mm -hmm, we need consistency mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. i think we can sway a lot more people to that we can then marginalize 
the most extreme ideas and then the extreme zealots that really do buy into it at the time will have to doubt when their ideas start falling out of favor. Okay. Wow. That's what we need. I mean, I'm so you're writing a book about this, correct? Yeah. And will there be a chapter on <laughs> what we do? Yes, the, the final chapter. <laughs> Can you have a little like <laughs> pamphlet, you know, to start a group? The, I always ask the same two questions at the end. I know we've been going, I, I could talk to you for like 12 hours. <laughs> what is the biggest, your biggest character fl flaw, defective character, vice, however you want to interpret that, that you've been either working against in your lifetime or even right now that's getting in your way, that gets in your way? I, I am too easily baitable. I'm not able to ignore things <laughs> that I should ignore. If somebody is... um have the misunderstanding me, misinterpreting me or criticizing my character. I can't do it. And this is what the team says to me all the time. Ignore these people. They're talking in bad faith. No, nope. I have it's to. It's like a Russian bot. I, <laughs> I have to go round and round with them, getting more and more distressed, wasting more and more time. And I, I really need the confidence, I think, to say, it doesn't matter that those people, you, you've got all the information out there. You can explain anything that they don't understand. They don't have to think you're a good person or you know what you're talking about. You do. You right. know you are. <laughs> right. My, I had an ex who said this. He was like this. He would argue with people and he was very brilliant. And he just said he had a pathological need to be understood. Yeah. He hated it when he was being misrepresented or misunderstood. Exactly. And he would get into these arguments with people. And I'm like, if they don't want to understand, they're not going to, you know, they're, they're, there's, this isn't good faith always they're they're coming at, they just want to argue with you and get attention. Yeah. That's great. I And I think a lot of us fall into that trap online. I'm much better about it than I was probably two years ago. But I see you've been quite good with this. Yeah, I don't. I because I don't. I it's an attention game, too. It's giving it's and also moving into 2020, the election. I remember reading. I think a journalist was saying like the bots are out in full force and you don't want to fall into the trap of elevating and and giving a voice to bots and it actually makes the AI stronger every time you argue with it. So it's getting, and you don't know if it's a Russian bot or if it's some, it's so she was like moving into 2020. I just have a rule that I'm not arguing with somebody unless I know who they are, unless there's somebody that is coming at me from my media or from, you know, someone, you know, who's from another outlet. But if it's just a random, like, you know, egg, or like nobody, then it's not, you just don't know who you're arguing with. And what is your biggest asset other than being absolutely brilliant and <laughs> ethical? I don't know. I, I think, I, I think what a lot of people have told me is that I can kind of bring clarity to things and, and break them down. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think my strongest asset is a sort of a verbal reasoning and clarifying. Mm -hmm of things. Mm -hmm. Well, you've certainly helped me in the three or four days that we've been spending time together because I have felt a bit lost. It, it, when you do push back against, and particularly the leftists, you get the kind of onslaught of like you're out of the party, but then I felt homeless. I always say this politically homeless. A lot of people are feeling this. My tribe is tribeless, but I'm not exactly sure what I'm even standing for, but maybe it's just because the principles, the universal liberal principles are so ingrained in me that I just take them. I am standing for them. I just um, can't articulate them because I have taken them for granted for so long. Mm. And I think maybe that's part of what my work is. And a lot of people who are going to listen to this and is to remind myself and brush up on what those universal liberal, those principles are yeah. that we're standing for. Because I just took them all for granted and Jonah Goldberg who many people can't stand but he said that this is a miracle we kind of all stumbled into and it only takes one generation to lose it and that is a hill I will die on so where can <laughs> we find you uh, well I'm, I'm on Twitter at H Pluckrose and, and, and you're you can... amazing on Twitter everyone <laughs> follow her and you can find my um, magazine at uh, areomagazine.com where we publish a lot of the, the best writers from both sides of the political spectrum Thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. Oh, thanks, Bridget. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Marshall Herskovitz announced today that... Hold on. Let me read it. We're so ahead of the curve here on Walk-Ins. Welcome. 
Uh, 30-something sequel series from Marshall Herskovitz, Ed Zwick, and MGM in the works. Fun. You think they'll have Brad Pitt back on to guest star? <laughs> Maybe. I hope I have a role. Marshall Herskovitz and Ed Zwick's beloved 1987 drama 30-something is making a comeback. I have learned that the duo is pitching a new incarnation of the show, which is garnering interest from multiple networks. Written by 30-something creators Herskovitz and Zwick and to be directed by Zwick, I hear the follow-up series revolves around the children of the characters in the original show, which are now 30-something themselves. Nice. He dropped this on our podcast. He did. He hinted heavily. He hinted. He knew. I had a feeling he was hinting that this was coming down uh-huh. the pipes. I never actually watched that show. I was too young. And my it, mom was obsessed my, with it. I think that. my parents watched it, but we were not allowed. Yeah, yeah, I remember watching it with my mom and not understanding, and she cried like every episode. Uh-huh. But I do I do remember growing up with it. Yeah. I was young. I was like 10. Yeah. Nine or 10. Yeah. And then I remember when, I even remember when like, it, they, they had complex relationships that were very grown up. Yeah. I shouldn't have been watching it. <laughs> no, I bet you shouldn't have. Why don't I have any faith in marriages or relationships? <laughs> I blame 30 something. <laughs> it was like one guy was having an affair. It was kind yeah. of a schmarm. Well, there, but there's really no way to watch the show now, right? I think you can. Somebody did watch it for, uh, they, they did a whole piece on it and they mm-hmm. watched it. I'll have to look this up now that the reboot is happening. Yes, I want to roll in the reboot. So what else is going on, Bridget? Nothing. I almost drank last night. What? So I went to a meeting. Yeah, it just creeps. Yeah. I really understand. It was a bad night, actually. I really understand why people kill themselves in sobriety. (laughs) I mean, it's probably not funny for me to laugh at, but... (laughs) my brain just gets so loud and then it just spirals. It's like, it just gets so loud and then I just want to be normal. And I was like, this is the, this is the God shot though that always happens and why it's so good that I've trained myself to just like get to a meeting. Like I was walking hope and I could feel my brain just like spiraling. And I I was like, I want to go eat gummies. I just don't want to be in my head. I want to black out. I want to drink a gallon of whiskey and just be, have a break from my brain. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, not too long ago, this guy in our in our in our um, program jumped off a building. And when I hear that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, I'm not like that's hor-. like my first instinct isn't isn't like that's horrible. My first instinct is like, yeah, I get it. Uh-huh. I understand that inclination. And then I just was alone and. Maybe it's just a product of like sitting still for the first time in a while and recalibrating. Like I've been working too much and putting work first and Mm -hmm. not doing enough spiritual, physical, putting that stuff first like I need to. But I've been saying this. I'm like this. It's also a month, three weeks away from my six year anniversary. And I get squirrely. Yeah. And I just get squirrely this time of year. My friends all from the farm were texting me yesterday. They're like, come up and visit. And I just want to get out of my head or out. I'm restless, Mm -hmm. irritable, and discontent, which is the nature of being an alcoholic. And so then I was just walking back with hope and I was like, I need to go to a meeting. I have, I am grateful that I've been trained like smart feet. Yeah. Just get, get your body there and your shitty brain will go with you. Uh And, it was this meeting and all the speakers said kind of every version of what I needed to hear. Just one girl was talking about, it was two speakers. One girl was talking about how she relapsed all the time and and um, how she can't just have one and she doesn't want to. And I was like, yep, that's true. Because I it, this is why even today with like all of this stuff in the news and everybody gets bat- mad at me for being one of those shitty both sides people. But I don't trust my my first conclusion last night was walk to the dispensary and get gummies. Mm -hmm. My second thought and that and go get a then go to the liquor store and get a bottle of Jack Daniels. My second best thought was then kill yourself. My third best thought was maybe I should go to a meeting. So it takes me a couple of thoughts before I have a good one. Mm -hmm. So I don't trust my conclusions. I also saw how quickly my brain was like. You've been sober for a while. It was like when I saw that shooting and immediately started lying to myself and watched my brain 
lying to myself when I witnessed the shooting that that wasn't a shooting, that wasn't a gun, that was probably just kids playing. Like how quickly my brain can be like, make things comfortable for me by lying and or justifying something that I believe or want to believe or want. Mm -hmm. It's like that Chinese saying we should be distrustful of what we want. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the meeting and it was good. And then I was crying on the phone to one of my friends on the way to the meeting. And I was like, I just want to be normal. I just want to have a couple normal drinks like a normal fucking person. It's just so annoying. I want to like go to a barbecue and have kids and be a fucking idiot who likes The Bachelor. And I still feel this like resentment and rage even today. And then I go to the fucking meeting and I sit down next to this guy and I was saying this to my friend on the way to the meeting and he has his big book and on it is a fucking pen that says The Bachelor. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like God is perpetually laughing at me or I was in the right place. But yeah, I'm definitely like struggling. And maybe it's self-sabotage, but it's definitely like the minute I'm like, what is this all for? It just cre it's so creeping. It's so like creeping. And I think I just I try to like make it look easy. And I and like the guy at the meeting that I was sitting next to, he's he had 30 plus years and he's like, you know, you come and get sober and you realize that it's not the drinking and the drugs. It's like the thinking and it's just exhausting. I just don't want to be in my brain anymore. Mm. I want to be like. I want to take like a drill to it, like in pie. And then I was watching um, Inside Bill's Brain when I got home and it's better. Like that it made me grateful because I have so much and I for I am so I forget and and I forget how I think I'm just maybe not using my brain the way I should be using it. Like the th what I was came away from after the first episode of this three-part documentary is that I re I'm so resentful of Trump and this news cycle because it sucks all the oxygen out of the news cycles that are important and that matter. Mm -hmm. Like kids that don't have water and problems that we could be putting our minds to and our ingenuity to. And instead, everyone gets sucked in. I feel like I'm just petty. Like my thoughts are petty and small and... Um, I want to be inspirational and grateful and I feel like this news cycle sucks everyone into like the worst version of themselves no matter how hard you try. You just become like petty and and yucky or at least my experience of it has been that I've felt, you know, it's like I want to feel um like part of me is like, LOL, none of this matters. And then it, that's just a defense mechanism to feeling helpless in the face of it and also confused. And also feeling like if you are confused and feel like you're choosing between essentially two dictators in this election, for instance, not dictators, but like it's like shitty choices, then you're being forced into a binary and maybe into a conviction that you don't even have. And I just, res I resent that. I want, I think it's like people, people should have a right to be confused and not know. And I underestimate probably like the toll it takes, like yeah. constantly hearing shit online and getting shit and getting, and it's like, I'm choosing to put myself out there, but then I'm like, why am I doing this? Yeah. I don't, I don't know why I want to like, I don't want to, I don't know that I'm built for it or if it's even like good for me as somebody who's in recovery and an alcoholic. I don't know. I just, I've been feeling like I just want to retreat or like disappear. I literally almost like shut down my entire Twitter account just because I, I don't, it's so much noise. And then I see like all these kids suffering all over the world. I'm like, why are we focusing on this shit? We have the resources to help all these people suffering. And we're focusing on like gender Barbies. It's just such a like misplaced priority. Mm -hmm. We just have such fucked priorities. And then I get like it, it goes to like nihilism. Mm -hmm. I just feel like and that's why being inside Bill's brain was good. It was like he's so optimistic kind of eternally. 
and puts his mind and innovation to like solving huge problems. Does it seem unsolvable? I don't know. It's like, I think it's, I think the news cycles are hard, getting harder and harder. And I don't, they're just, um, they make me sad. I think people are struggling. Yeah. And then they just tune out because yeah. why, why would, wh- of course. Mm-hmm. And I can't tune out. Mm-hmm. I don't have that ability. Mm-hmm. Like I want to just swallow a bottle of fucking Xanax. Well, I don't understand why people think, why people rage at you for seeing both sides of an issue. I don't understand that. Because thinking. it assaults tribalistic thinking. Right. So if you're, if you are, if you are invested in your, beliefs and your biases then i understand it's an assault to that you're essentially saying like hey maybe there's more to this than you maybe it's not as black and white my biggest question is always like you would how and the left and the right both do this in this binary that we're fucking trapped in and they'll say like i see it like with the for instance, with the Greta thing. I'm like, if this girl was out there preaching pro-life, you know, and like starting a worldwide movement for pro-life, she would be upheld by the right as like a deity. Mm -hmm. And she would be, everybody else would say it was child abuse on the left, Mm -hmm. that they're taking this girl who has autism or Asperger's and they're using her as a political to like push through political. And... I've seen people, adults talk about kids, whether it's the Covington kids or Greta, just in like disgusting ways. I'm like, you're a grown up. Don't rely on this child to save you. Don't rely on this child to save you, but also like, okay, she's a kid and she's like, don't like, right. You don't need to like pile on her for, you know, right. She's, she's also kid. like a puppet. Do you remember which the fucked stupid up. things you thought when you were a kid? Not that I'm calling what she's saying stupid, but like, yeah, the, we, you're clueless when you're a child. And especially I've worked with kids with Asperger's and autism. They get fixated on something Mm. and you can't, it's hard to get their mind off that track, but they're, that doesn't mean they're right. Uh It's just weird. We live in such a weird, it's such like, I think my, my defense mechanism generally is humor and like the dumpster fire actually does help because it's such a good outlet for me to just be like, this is all ridiculous. But then like the heaviness gets to me and it just, I, I am always, I've always said like the guy last night who was talking, he was talking about his first wife. He had like three wives and he said, it, and he was like, my first wife woke up one day and just got dressed and then decided she didn't want to live anymore. And I was like, that would be me. Mm-hmm. That would be like, I understand that. That I wouldn't be the person who was like depressed and then suddenly it was like, you would never even fucking know. People would be like, she was tweeting yesterday. Cause it just, it it's scary when it like takes over like that. It scares even me. It's like, so it just gets so, um, I don't know. It's so out of the blue. It's like this darkness. <laughs> It's alcoholism, though. Mm-hmm. It really is like so insidious. But the guy was saying, you know, we have a daily reprieve dependent on our spiritual condition. You cannot expect that this is something you don't have to treat daily. And just like whenever that happens, it's just a reminder that I need to like focus more on my connection to God and my faith yeah. and and. If you have to shut it all down, shut it all down. Like that, the most important thing is your sobriety, your mental well-being. That I mean, I feel fine. That's a weird thing. It's just like I think it just it's like my brain gets so loud, and I just want to turn it off. There's no other way to describe it. It's like I want out of my head. And I, by the way, I've been crying about this since I was ten years old. Mm -hmm. This isn't like a new feeling this is something that i i remember being a 10 year old kid saying to my mom that i felt like i i didn't i wanted to be like a normal kid and so i don't this is not like something that came this is like a long-standing feeling i just wanted to be like for always have wanted to be free of it well i was editing that jamie kilstein podcast last night and 
you guys talk a lot about suicide. Yeah. And Brody, your friend, the comedian, and oh, Robin I Williams. It. Yeah. And you, and, but you did say, you were like, the thing is, is I know when I get in those places that this too shall pass, you know, whether it's good or bad. I, I know that if I just hang in there a couple days, usually. Yeah. It's that like not trusting that first and second thought. Mm -hmm. It's why I don't trust my conclusions about anything. You know, people are like, you should trust yourself. I'm like, no, I don't. I can't. I can maybe trust my third conclusion after I've run the first two by people, but I don't. My first and second conclusions are usually like do something self-destructive or die. Mm -hmm. And then I get to something that's like, oh, maybe pray, reach out. I'm lucky that I've trained myself to like just go like a zombie. I just went to a meeting mm -hmm. and sat down. But I, I'm lucky a, a lot of people like in early sobriety, I didn't have that. It was I was much more tortured even then. Mm -hmm. I think like anyone who's in the first couple of years, it's so it's so hard. You literally have to train yourself to be like, go to when I feel like that, I'm like, go to a meeting, mm -hmm. even if I don't want to, even if everything in me is like, so now I'm doing 90 and 90 because I'm like, obviously I need a meeting like every day, maybe more. And then I resent the fact that I need that, but it's better than like, I, there's no alternative. Like there's just, there's no, I'm grateful that I have so many people that I, I'm grateful that I'm out about being sober because those are the things that keep me sober and alive is just thinking like my, you know, about my family members and my friends and people online who have like, I've helped or inspired or just my very act of being sober have, and, and that, you know, in those moments when I'm like that first thought of like, I should just go throw this all away. It's like, no, then how that would suck for all these other people too. Mm -hmm. It's not just me that it would affect. Mm -hmm. It would have like a ripple effect in the same way that when you do good, it has a ripple effect or when you better yourself, it has a ripple effect you probably don't even know about. Yeah. When you do things that are self-destructive, it has ripple effects that are long reaching, probably more than you realize. I don't know. I didn't think I had anything to talk about when I sat down today. I kind of buried the lead. <sighs> I was like, I almost drank last night. Yeah. It's just hard. Being sober is hard. I've, I sometimes just, I like it, but I just wish that I, it's like, what do they say in the big book? The del delusion of every alcoholic is the d desire, like the idea that we can drink normally mm -hmm. and we'll chase it to like our death. Mm -hmm. It's just like, and that is something that it just creeps. Like you can drink, you, you've been sober long enough. And then I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I don't have any desire to have one drink. That's uh -huh. a lie. I tell uh -huh. myself consistently, you can have just one glass of wine. You can go. Like, no, I want I want oblivion. That's all I've ever wanted. Uh -huh. I would have a needle in my arm in like a week if I went out. There's no doubt in my mind about that. It wouldn't be like, it would be like a kamikaze mission. And that's also a good reminder because, you know, you cruise along, I think, when you have long time, long, like longer term sobriety and forget that that desperation that you had in the beginning when you just felt powerless and you forget how close to like that shit's always just right on my shoulder. And I forget that little devil is always right there. But what advice would you have for someone who came to you feeling like this go to a meeting i mean if you're in a 12 if you're a 12 step like i think reaching out helps um i reached out to some of my friends immediately and but my my instinct is to, like go to sit my butt in a chair because i know it's what i need to do but i think reaching out and um knowing it will pass like just not acting like the pause when agitated or doubtful it's like okay obviously i'm agitated and these thoughts are i know they're not good praying like i definitely prayed that god would help me you know and and it, i was able to recognize too just kind of 
when that spiral takes hold, just it's so fucking crazy. It's crazy because I'm so present in the experience mm-hmm. of like, I don't even know what triggers it. It's just, I think I, I've, I've been saying, it's just been like building up. I've been feeling it, whether mm-hmm. it's like hormones or maybe I'm, it could be hormones. It could be a combination of that. Plus like my, you know, er- everyone gets squirrely around their anniversary coming up, all the things and working too much alcoholically and not all the, all of those things combined i've been feeling it and then something just kind of triggers the spiral but then what i observe is how quickly like self pity rushes in and then it's like oh poor me i can't be normal i just want to be like a, a girl with like a mom a, with like who watches real housewives and and enjoys like the simple things in life and it's it's uh and that's all a lie too. and it's a, a lie that that that, that like these pe- those right. people don't have struggles right that they're, like, they can't like be the alcoholics. people who are, like real housewives aren't alcoholics yeah. or like aren't struggling so it's just how quickly like the the self-pity will so getting into gratitude and just knowing that like I might have to sit, I'm uncomfortable. I might have to sit with it. I'm still uncomfortable today, but less uncomfortable. I'm less like spontaneously ready to combust than I was last night. Hmm. And just knowing to like, keep putting one foot in front of the other, you know, to do some exercise, go outside, be in nature, get offline. Yeah. Well, you know that you have a community of people who loves you and supports you. And yeah, you. I mean, that's not even a question. It's not like I feel isolated and alone in those moments. It's just more like I want out of my brain. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to explain it. I have felt this way since I was 10. Mm-hmm. Like I I don't, there's not, it has nothing to do with the people around me or my circumstances. It's really just that my brain gets so loud that it's it's so uncomfortable. And and it's just relentless. And I meditate and do acupuncture and run and do all these fucking things. And then when it feels like nothing is working, it's just like it. It's tiresome. It's it's weary. I get weary of my own brain. Mm-hmm. That's why people are like, "Do you listen to your podcast?" I'm like, "No." The last fucking thing I want to hear is myself. Mm-hmm. But sorry to leave this on such an uplifting message. I think reaching out though and just you know. I think being honest about it helps helps other people. I hate being honest about it. I don't even want to be honest about it now, but it's coming out of my mouth, so I feel like, I guess it was meant to be. It's a struggle. A struggle. of, And then, you know, just being grateful. Like, watching all these kids in the developed world, like, we're just so fucking lucky. My dog has more than most kids in the developed world. More water, more antibiotics more care more food she's a little chubby fat ass right now (laughs) and i just have to remember that you know put it and and maybe try and help people help those people in whatever way i can which feels impossible and limited but that is why i want to make a billion dollars like seeing what bill gates is doing i'm like yeah yeah that's why i want to make billions of dollars So that I can be like, there's a global problem with sanitation and then go fucking solve it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure. Maybe he's trying to rehab his image for being an absolute monster. But he's also doing good. He's brought the world toilets. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Manscaped and Ritual. Support for Walk-In's Welcome comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Do your ladies a favor. Hit manscaped.com up and use the code WALKIN. They'll thank you. Ritual is the obsessively researched vitamin for women. Better health doesn't happen overnight, and right now Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in the gaps of your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash walk-in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash walk-in. 
Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)